Hey, what's up, everyone? This is David Greenspan, and you are listening to the Mindshare Podcast, a proud member of the Industry Syndicate Media Network. Additional podcasts are available at industrysyndicate.com and mindshare101.com. This week's episode is sponsored by Kits Keep in Touch Systems. This is episode 27. So he started his real estate career at the age of 19 after spending some time studying marketing and motion picture films. At the age of 21, he became the youngest qualifying broker and brokerage owner in the state of New Mexico. A few years later, he made it as a top 30, under 30 finalist for Realtor Magazine. Taking his extensive real estate and marketing knowledge to the next level, he is now the CEO and founder of the Facebook marketing agency, Elevated Rem. Mr. Travis Tom, welcome to the Mindshare podcast. Hey, thank you for having me, David. Oh man, it's my pleasure, buddy. I'm really excited and I thank you. Uh, I know this one was a little bit short notice as well. Um, we've been meaning to get this one in now for yeah, a few months. I'm glad we did it. This is good, man. But uh, speaking of like where we first met, right? Uh, we had the good opportunity to share a stage together back in Arizona uh, a couple months ago. And before the event got started, you and I actually had a, uh, the chance to hang out and, and bottom line, just really get to know each other. And among the, <laughs> the many funny stories that you shared with us like all day long, uh, from the movie business to the job working with Victoria's Secret to the UFC fighters, it was really that UFC story in the, like with the pool and all that stuff that I was really? Really interested in. I mean, don't get me wrong, and you knew it that day. I was very excited about that Victoria's Secret stuff that you were doing. I thought that was cool. <laughs> but this yeah. one that you told us, this one was deep, and, and you know uh, you genuinely had me very intrigued that time when we were talking about it. So would you be able to share that one with us today? Like, I, yeah. I, I want to share with everybody kind of, you know, your background, but kind of how you went from, you know, going from one industry, getting into real estate, and then just – hitting your next stride and, 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 and getting to where you are today. It's, it's sort of that backstory that I was just, I loved it, man. Certainly. Yeah. So uh, you know, I started off um, you know, when I was about 19 years old, I, I dropped out of college and I realized that the film industry wasn't going to be the place for me. I, I, just, I really wanted to get to work right away. And I came home um, now directly from there it was not success. It, it was basically about three years of constant failure in the real estate industry, um, which you know, really attributes to my success now because one made me resilient, two, I got to hear pretty much every excuse and every objection um, <laughs> of why someone didn't wanna work with me. And I went through and I learned what I didn't like, what I didn't want, and what people wanted, right? And who the audience actually is. Um, so after three years of kind of struggling there, I really hit my stride with marketing and building items of reciprocity that I could give people because I figured, you know, you can't just constantly ask for the business, right? We think of Stephen Covey, Seven Highly Effective Habits author, right? Uh, where you know, he has this great quote that says, you have to make an emotional deposit with someone before you make a withdraw. Otherwise, it's going to end up at a negative balance. Okay. And three years, right, from me being, you know, 19 and, you know, onward, I was basically constantly trying to ask for business without giving anything emotional deposit, right, without making anything first with them. So there's no reciprocity, there's no trust. It was just, hey, gimme, gimme, gimme. It was all about me and not about them. So as soon what as I see that, that doesn't work, right? I realized very quickly. Well, not really quickly. I mean, it took me yeah, yeah. No, of course, yeah. no. for real. Yeah. <laughs> so after that, um, the business really put, picked up after I started, I changed that original mindset. And, you know, it was fast forward. Um, to where I was about 28 years old, um, I had a 32-person team. We had 271 listings under my name. 
Um, we had, you know, our video team, we had uh, our, our websites that we were developing in house on WordPress and, and develop, developing them and designing them. Um, and so things really kind of went into a whole other direction from where it started from. And it was right after, so our, our peak years actually were during the recession because we had basically mastered in our local market. Um, Facebook advertising and being able to build a huge email list that we just had our tribe that we would just nurture nonstop. So after the recession, um, we were still, we had this huge uptick and it was there during that time, you know, basically um, after a decade of doing this, I told my wife, I said, you know what, I, I want to go in a completely different direction. Um, I want to sell the company. And at that time, we built basically three real estate companies um, that, that we had. And we had our team in place. We had everything going on. I wanted to sell those and then move in the direction of working online and doing advertising because we had clients that we were starting to consult with here and there. Um, we had our single property websites, the landing pages that we had developed, and we were going to turn that into a software. Well, at the time, I, I decided, okay, let's go ahead and sell it. So we had, you know, her and I went out to lunch. We talked about the pros and cons. Um, and we had these plans of what we're going to do. Well, we sold it. We sold the company. And then it was like right afterwards, I kind of, I kind of lost this, um, I guess, sense of purpose almost. And a lot of founders so let's talk about this where they, you know, every single day you show up with a defined purpose to build a company and to help people, right. And help them build and to serve. And then after a while, I mean, you know, a decade of it, um, the second that that stops, you know, your whole, every cell in your body has been trained to do a specific task for a decade. You start to kind of go, well, you know, I don't have that anymore. What, what am I supposed to do? That, that sort of is, uh, that's what I was about to ask about. Cause that was one thing I, and I, again, I may have said this to you when we first went through, but like successful, like you went and built a successful team. You had a lot of listings, a lot of people under you, you built these businesses. Why sell that? Yeah. And I mean, I'd, I'd love to learn how you sold it, but let's do that on another conversation. Cause I'm sure there's a whole thing about that, but like just what, you're going cold turkey. You're totally changing exactly everything you're doing right now from a day to day when you wake up in the morning. Right. That's a big shift. It's a big shift. And, and you know, the, the reason why I wanted to sell is I, I saw an opportunity to compete on an international level. And I felt that I had achieved what we wanted to achieve with our company in a brief period of time um, for the market that we were in. But I, I just felt that, there was a cap um, and I really wasn't absolutely hundred percent fulfilled. Um, you know, to be honest, I, I wasn't, I wasn't feeling the absolute love and energy that I do what I'm doing now. Yeah. And I think, you know, with any kind of business that can happen. Um, but there's elements of what we were doing in the real estate business that always, you know, before we jumped on, I said the things that kind of give me joy, right? Um, and the things that give you joy, I think you should really pay attention to those because that's what fuels you, right? That's when you get into that sense of flow in that yeah, sense of great, flow is basically great. where, yep. right? It's like three hours have gone, have gone by, but it felt like five minutes. And when you get paid for that, then it's this compounding effect of, of, you know, goodness that really just makes you better what you do. And then also just a happier life in general, right? Um, so that's when I decided to do it. Uh, this is no longer as fun as I want it to be. And we're making the move, but now we're at the point where like, wait a second, what did I do? Right, right. It's right? like we're, we're, we're making money. This is great. You know, we're having fun with it to some degree, but I see something else that I want and I want to build that um, and I want to get to that next level. So we sold, you know, sold the company and then it was this, this really kind of weird period because I just really sort of kind of scratched my head of like, well, shit, what do I do now? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> do this, right? Um, 
And so I was so focused, I think, on selling the company that I really didn't have exactly, you know, everything dialed in about like, all right, how we're going to make this, this, this work really fast. Um, so, I, you know, I kind of got a little depressed about it and I wasn't quite sure, uh, you know, I was kind of going through like, all right, what, who am I, right? And, and, and what am I? And, and I was this, you know, young, you know, real estate kid that was, um, had a chip on my shoulder, kind of, you know, going through the underdog yeah, kind of yeah. uh, feeling of like, I'm fighting against corporate, I'm an independent brokerage, I'm doing all these things on my own, but that's what defined me at the time. And then I didn't have that. So my wife suggested that I go start swimming again. And so during this, this time, of course, I'm, you know, we're starting to kind of build the other company. We're starting to kind of uh, take some of the proceeds that we had and d- 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 building our development team and our design team and, you know, working these things in the background. But at the same time, I'm kind of struggling with my own mindset, right? Of one, can I actually do this? Two, um, are we, is it going to make money? Right. And then three, like beyond that, who, who, who am, who am I? Right. What am I? So I started to go back to swimming and I grew up swimming. And I, I, I love swimming. It's kind of like where I get my zen and my meditation. And, and the so I call them that a big Harley Davidson, but I get it. Like, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Riding, yeah, riding a Harley can be its own. <laughs> Listen, that's, yeah. my, that's my zen right there. It sounds great. Love that, nice man. and loud, but I can't hear anybody. I can't talk to anybody. You know, I can't right. Wait, it's it's mind numbing zen. Totally, man. Yeah. So, I, so same kind of thing. I, I needed to have that that period of time where I'm not really you know, hearing anything yeah. and you, you're just, you're just kind of in this flow. So I started swimming and it started showing up at my old uh, high school pool. Um, and I would go there about every other day and about a couple of weeks in um, I'm swimming. And then I noticed these guys far off in, in the in lane, and they're yelling and they're, they're, you know, kind of screaming at each other. And there's this, uh, this woman standing at the end of the pool, all dressed in black. And she's got these combat boots on. Um, she's a really fierce, you know, looking woman that has this, you know, kind of military cap on as well. And this combat knife, you know, on her, oh, yeah. on her side. And I had seen her pull up actually. She's at the pool her. with a knife. Don't mess with her. Don't mess with her. She, <laughs> she pulled up on her own Harley to the pool. I'd seen her like a couple of days ago. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, so she's not swimming. She's just at the edge of the pool giving these guys commands on what to do. So she's all dressed in black. And I'm like, this is interesting. And I, I get up and I sort of walk over. And I, I'm curious now because really it's about six lanes of people that are in their 70s and 80s. Um, and then there's, you know, me. And then there's all these guys in this in lane that are just uh, like monstrous looking. They're huge. Yeah. Right? They are just beasts and they've got tattoos all over, right? They're pretty rough looking. So I ask her, I say, uh, you know, just saw you guys and was kind of curious. Are, are you, you know, part of the, the there's a military base? There's a military base just about a quarter mile away. So I said, are you, you know, guys, Navy SEALs or, you know, special ops? Um, Cause sometimes, you know, they train around there. She said, no, no, honey, these are champions. These are UFC fighters. And so I look in the pool and I, and I start to see, and I recognize like all like Diego Sanchez and Q Jardine and all Crazy, of these right? guys like actual fighting champions, uh, Clay Guadia, all these guys that are in there. And I'm like, oh shit, this is, these are like real UFC fighters. Yeah, this is crazy. really cool. So uh, I said, so what are you doing? She said, well, I'm the strength and conditioning coach. And she's like, I basically work with the UFC and they send their fighters to me, their top fighters. And they come here because it's high altitude. Um, so then we train them in the pool. And she's about, well, I train them also about fear and how to really fight through that fear in the ring when they're getting choked out or when they're you know, getting their face punched in. And basically it's the last couple seconds of, do I panic? How do I make a decision? What do I do? What's my next move? Love so she said, the water symbolizes 
you know, that fear, that drowning sensation. So we push them through it, but we, she's like, I also just, you know, really work them. Um, so, so they're really conditioned. And I just kind of stare at them for a little bit, kind of, you know, them silent for a little bit. And she says, do you want to swim with them? Yeah, crazy, right? Right? So I'm like, well, uh, yeah, sure. Why, why not? Like, okay. Show up for you, were, you were definitely very lost at that time. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was like, well, you know, why, why not, right? So, um, and, and I, I'd been used to training with teams uh, in, in the past. And, you know, so I was kind of like, well, this would be nice, you know, to train with the team, right? So she says, show up Friday. So I show up Friday and I get there and I'm the only guy uh, with like a Speedo and goggles, right? And I'm pretty sure I actually have like my swim cap on too. So, so of course, like instantly I'm sticking out like a sore thumb, right? I look like, you know, uh, a, a swimming frog yeah. um, and everyone else is in their fighting shorts. So she, first thing she does is ties uh, my legs together with a tow rope from like basically this, this, you know, a giant tow rope that you would have and ties a five pound dumbbell to the end of it. And I'm like, this is day one. This is day one. This, this is, is day, day one. one. This is the first two minutes into, you know, we're not going to, you know, address what we're going to do for the day or what's going to happen or, Hey, nice to meet so-and-so. Um, and basically she says, dive in, swim. So I dive in, I start swimming and I get maybe about like 10, 15 feet out. And then I just start to sink. Right. And I'm like, Oh shit. Like, you know, and, and I, and I look up and I see all these other guys and they have, so I'm in the bottom of the pool now and they each have like five to 10 pounds also tied to their ankles and they're, they're struggling, right? They're trying oh, in the bottom. You can see that their legs are just like working it at the top. You're kind of like, Oh, there's floating around moving really slow. And that's what, cause that's what I thought. Yeah. And now I'm at the bottom. So I, I, you know, kick my legs up. I go back up to the top and take a huge breath and try not to drown. And then I just start hustling and working my ass off to try and get to the, to the next ledge. Well, we go through the full day of back and forth and things like this. And now we're diving for 20 pound breaks at the bottom of the pool. Um, and we, we, so after that, she's like, all right, you, you, you made it. There's one guy that threw up. There's another guy that started crying and she actually kicked him out. Wow. Um, I mean, you, you know, these are like, you know, fully grown men, yeah. that are, you know, beating the crap out of people. So yeah, she's kicking their ass and here you are coming along with your like, you know, swimming cap on. Right. Yeah. I'm not fighting anybody. You started to yeah. crush it though. Right. <laughs> right. So I, so I worked hard, I mean, I'm a swimmer, so it was kind of natural for me, but you know, all these weights and different things. Yeah. So over the course of uh, several weeks, you know, we're trying out different things. We've got these big plastic kind of like conquistador looking helmets on our hands to weigh us down. We're wow. diving for the bricks, you know, about maybe a hundred times and, and we have to hold our breath underwater and interlock our arms with each other. And, and you know, we're, we're passing like the one minute and 30 second mark. Um, it's getting to a point where it's getting like, you know, really intense. And, you know, it, she then has this ex Navy seal that's in there too. And so she recognizes that I'm pretty fast at swimming and he's pretty fast at swimming. And so she comes up with this whole thing where, there's two of the UFC swimmers basically that, that are in front of us. And then she tells them to go. And then when they get about halfway down the pool, um, she would call us the sharks and she would say, all right, sharks go. And before she didn't give us any prep time for this. She just said, I want the both of you to swim as fast as you can grab them by the ankle, pull them underneath the water, push them down and swim over them and get to the other side and then wait for them. And then we're going to do it again. And we're going to do this for every single person here, basically for the next half hour. Wow. Which is, which is a really exhausting <laughs> workout yeah, sure. for, for anybody. So we do it. And I'm thinking in my mind, like, shit, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to grab this guy. I'm going to pull him underneath the water. He's going to almost drown. And you know, he's going to kick the shit out of me. Yeah, say, he's right? gonna this is like naturally, of course, it's going to happen when you pick a fight. Because right? that's what you're doing essentially, right? You're going to fight with a UFC fighter. Because <laughs> they don't know. They don't know what's coming up. Because she didn't tell them. 
Um, so, you know, so we go and I grab him by the ankle and I pull him down and I swim over him. And it's, it's Clay Guardia, um, who, if, if you guys haven't seen him, uh, look him up, uh, an amazing fighter. So I get to the edge, I get to the side, and here he comes, right? And so I'm getting ready for my whole, like, hey, <clears throat> you know, she told me, right? So he comes up and he puts his, his uh, hand around my neck and he says, do it faster next time. Oh, wow. So instantly I'm like, oh, wow, this is, th like, these guys are not alarmed by this they they are here to train right. and they want it to be faster and harder because they want someone else to push them to that next level right and a lot of these guys are freaked out about the water i mean you know they're not swimmers right yeah, they're yeah. fighters so they're absolutely terrified and they're working through their own demons and their own mindset of you know how do i get out of this uh you know and so they're in, some are embracing it and some are really freaked out by it. and over time this has really started to build my confidence and then i started to see that you know every other week there'd be one guy saying hey i'm headed out to japan or hey i'm, I'm headed out to germany or i'm headed out to mexico or las vegas to, to fight and everyone would rally with them and you know, get them all prepped and prepared for that next fight and some of these guys were even fighting each other but yeah. there was still this like camaraderie of like Brother yeah man, you know we're, we're yeah. here for you so it started to shift my mindset of training with champions, right? That if you want to be a champion, you got to train with champions. Mm -hmm. And then I started to go, you know what? I need my own fights, whether, you know, I'm not going to actually fight someone in the yeah, ring. Yeah. And I used to, you know, uh, being about four different martial arts when I was in my teenage years. But, you know, I, I'm not going to fight any of these guys for sure. Um, <laughs> so I decided, Smart you know what, I need something that's going to scare me something big that is going to terrify me just enough to get me out of my comfort zone to then really push me something that I need to train for essentially. Yep. And it was, um, this big open water race, uh, that was where you would swim from Alcatraz to the San Francisco Bay. And it was 1.7 miles. Um, the water is about 53 degrees. So if you, you know, basically turn on the cold water in your bathtub and fill it up, that's almost where 53 degrees is at. It's really, really cold. Yeah. Um, and I said to you at the time, from what we've heard, at least from the movies and the document, there's a lot of sharks in that water too. Never mind like the sea lions and stuff swimming around. Like that's, not just, that, that, that's not like your regular, I mean, it's not just a freshwater lake over here where you might have some like fish. Right. Right. It's, it's cool. It's cool. And there's, there's some, you know, so some wild. It's just real. Guy. It's real deal. Yeah. It's totally. a real deal. You might have yeah. to watch out for it. And I, and I think subconsciously in my mind, I was thinking that, you know, this escape from Alcatraz race that I was going to go into was subconsciously, it, it was probably, I was thinking, I'm going to break out of this prism, right? Yeah. I'm going to emulate because it emulates essentially the same uh, uh, way that they did break out. So right, cool. crossed the water and got to the land and yeah. did the thing. So this mental prison that I was kind of in, in my own way of going, you know, these limited beliefs, right? Can I build a software as a service company? Can I be more than just what I was? Can I actually achieve the goals that I have set in place, right? So during all of that, um, I'm working hard right i'm really working hard with these guys training with them and they're pushing me too because now they know that i've got, got a fight coming up essentially I, exactly yeah. i've got my own you know kind of champion fight coming up and they're each pushing me they're each driving me um and then i i go um well so a couple of weeks before the race i we're diving for bricks um and I'm then at the bottom of the pool with Diego Sanchez, and there's about 14 of us. Um, so at the end of every swim session, what we would do is that she, we would go through these sprints, right? The whole shark and the fish thing, right? I'd have to capture them. Yeah. And then at the end, we would have to really quickly be able to um, lower our heart rate and just be able to find that moment of zen and be completely confident and calm so what she would do is she would say all right everybody at the bottom of the pool and then at that point it's basically who can hold their breath the longest right wow. so we would first start off with about 
60 seconds of just, uh, you know, above water, trying to calm our breathing, getting it right, and then go to the bottom of the pool. And I can see, you know, open my eyes, you know, every now and then there's swimmer after swimmer kind of popping up. And then it's just me and Diego Sanchez, uh, just kind of, you know, doing our thing. And Diego's in this complete, like, legs crossed, laid this whole, you know, like, zen. You know, just, <laughs> just, you know. He's in full meditation whole, mode. <laughs> yeah, he's like an old, the trails in old plane. And I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm fighting and fighting and fighting it and trying, you know, but um, I, you know, I go up and then he's still down there. And I think it was like a minute and 23 seconds. Um, and then he got like a minute, and like 37 seconds. So. Mm-hmm. It was it was a defining moment for me of doing right this. there, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm training with these champions that are basically changing my mindset on how to approach life and how to approach what you can do. And now I'm confident for this next phase, which is this big race. Yeah. Well, during that whole diving for bricks and then um, being down there, I didn't I didn't regulate my pressure, my nose quite. Uh, right. And what happened is I, I cracked a uh, sinus cavity and um, some blood started coming out when I, when I hit the surface. So I got a little injured during that, but I was like, Oh, it's just, you know, just a nosebleed, um, just some minor pressure. Well, go to the race and I, I do the race. Um, there's 250 people in the race. I am basically, I, I am 19th person to, uh, touch the shore Wow! and did it in 44 minutes. That's crazy. Yeah. It, and I Congrats, went to man. time warp. It felt like I was basically, it felt like seven minutes, but it was really like 40, you know, 40, a little over 44 minutes. Um, it was this insane, just like your body's a machine, just working through it. And did it. And it was like this exhilarating feeling of like, yeah, I, you know, I fucking did it, man. I, yeah. I conquered this. And I had this amazing confidence afterwards. And then all the fighters, when I went back, when they were just, you know, exhilarated and wanted to see my medal that I won and were so excited for me. Um, and then it was about a week and a half later where we're up in, in Colorado. Uh, it's high altitude and it's around three in the morning. I get this massive pain in my forehead and it felt like my eye was gonna like just bulge like just actually like fall out of, of my skull wow and it was this really intense pain so my wife drives me to the hospital we get an emergency uh mri and it turns out that um 100 percent of my uh sinus cavity um is blocked with a staph infection so from the injury in the pool where it cracked and then swimming in the bay with sewage and diesel, it got this wicked staph infection that said, so before this goes to your brain and, and kills you, we need to get it out. Wow. So we do emergency surgery. They wrote a rooter basically up to my nose, up into my skull, like get, you know, get clean all of that out. And, and then, um, it was, it was a pretty gnarly, you know, uh, s- surgery, but a couple of weeks after that, I'm back in the pool, I'm back swimming. And we then, um, just found out then two weeks later that our daughter, uh, well, that we were going to have a daughter, that we were yeah. going to have a kiddo. We found out we were pregnant and, um, then fast forward after that, we launched our software for our company about four weeks uh, after our daughter was born. And that, that, all of that kind of happened in a short period of time. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what drove me to really be able to say, you know what, I can do this and I can achieve much more and we can still be able to you know, achieve our dreams. Um, and really it was, it, was, it was mindset, right? It was just finding another purpose and then driving myself and you know, this weird odd way the universe kind of aligned and said, Hey, we found this group of champions that you should be training with, um, who are all working on their own mindset. And this coach, you know, that basically, um, it's funny. I don't think she ever really charged me. Uh, you know, now that, now to think about it, she, she just was like, yeah, you know, seems like you might need some help. That, so. That's the bigger, that's the bigger universe out there that anybody can laugh at mock, think it's corny, think it's bullshit. Right. That shit's real. 
You know, yeah. that stuff happens for a reason. You see something for a reason. You bump into someone for a reason. There's a reason that everything happens. Um, I mean, but I remember when you told me that story, it was just awesome. And it was just as awesome once again, because again, that's where, you know, it's, it's mindset, right? And I, I think that everybody listening for everybody, no matter what you're going through, I've said it before and I'll say it again, the sun's coming up again tomorrow. It's, it's happening. So yep. you've got to get yourself up and over whatever hurdles you're facing to get yourself moving and get on to that next level of your business. And again, I, I, I know that my, my sort of thing today was to learn a lot more about Facebook marketing. I want to get into that now, but I really, I remember that story. It stuck with me. And I remember saying to you at that time, I want to reshare that to people because I think that, you know, beyond Facebook marketing, beyond any marketing, I think everybody's got to wake up with this real self-confidence in right. who they are what they can achieve, and then never, ever allow other people to bring you down. Yeah. And when your own mind brings you down, because it happens to every single one of us on this earth, there's always a way to get out of that, you know, yeah. and you will always come out of it stronger. And I mean, you know, my dad used to say this to me, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of you for learning to lose. And I went, learning to what? Lose? I'm like, no, man, I want to win. He goes, no, no, no. Like, you don't understand. And, and I mean, he always used the hockey tryouts, for me, right? But it was... You know, you go out, you try out for a team, and if you got cut, you were like looking at your watch going, Dad, the next one's down the street, we can get there. And he's like, we would take you over there, and like you'd make a hockey team. And he's like, you just, you didn't want to give up. And he goes, I really commended that. And, and, and that stuck with me. And I mean, I think even today, and again, we all go through the shit, and we all feel like giving up every once in a while, or we have our problems. But learning, you know, experiencing the trials and tribulations and, and, and learning to overcome them. Yep. Makes us that much stronger. And I mean, I think that that's what happened to you. And, and I mean, when we, when we do fast forward on that whole thing and I now look, you know, where you're at now with respect to the biz and, and, and the successes you've had, I mean, there's, there's proof right there in the entire story, right? You just yeah, got to overcome it. You just, you just, you know, it, it's, it's being able to fail forward um, and really be able to look at it with a, a different pair of eyes to say, yeah. okay, you know, how can we learn from from what happened and, and build build upon it? Um, you know, I mean, it, it's it's one of those things we think of. Uh, what was it? The uh, uh, the light bulb, right? When that you know, was was created, and the guy's name escapes me. I should know this. It's like a third grade fact. But uh, uh, for for what do you mean for? Um... Think of who created the light bulb, right? Oh who my was... god! Why are we both flubbing on that right now? I know, right? That's this horrible. Is... <laughs> we well, internet? whoever knows oh somebody, my god everybody's sitting there yelling it to us right now going probably yeah post in the comments and we're about to uh, we're about to go oh yeah right so he you know he, there's a story of him where, where basically he had told people that it was already invented and created was it edison was. yeah thomas edison. Edison. Yeah. edison edison thomas edison thank there you, you. <laughs> third grade yeah um, um yeah so thomas edison yeah he'd already told people and this is made, this is part of like manifesting, right? Manifesting yep. it's your huge. you have to. It works. It, it, exactly. Just just it's going it's going to happen. It, right? It's going it's to. Like, like the way the raps are gonna going to win tonight. Right. <laughs> They're going to win. You're it's in Colorado. Awesome. You didn't say you're in the Bay Area. You only said you swam in Alcatraz, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah so we could be friends today. That's okay. <laughs> so so he I mean, he had told people, Edison had said, hey, it's already created. Um, and so he was getting, you know, he was getting people to basically like, believe that it was already there yeah. and then his belief, but in the background, I mean, it, it took him a thousand different, uh, versions to then finally make it work. But in the first couple of handfuls, right. He'd already said like, Oh yeah, it already works. It's already there. And so he was working purely just off of his, you know, mindset, changing what his beliefs were and thinking it already exists and I know it can and a thousand tries later, you know, he makes, he makes it happen, right? He manifests it to actually happen. And I think a lot of the times, right, every soul, I mean, every uh, cell in your body, right, every molecule is eavesdropping on your thoughts. Yeah. And so it's very important, your mindset, when you're going into something, because, you know, kinesthetically and everything else, your body then adapts to and builds that second nature response in accordance to your thoughts. So, you know, for me, I was in this kind of like, you know, oh, what do I do? Is this going to work? I'm not quite sure. I mean, I had the right amount of doubt, 
But at the same time, that doubt could have basically crushed everything. And I wouldn't right. have built the software as a service company. I wouldn't have built our coaching you know, program. I wouldn't have built our Facebook advertising agency and then this new you know, software recording. I mean, none of those companies would have been probably built if I had let fear whisper and me believe. So if I had just gone a little bit in a different direction and I, and I hadn't said, you know what, I, I need to actually challenge those thoughts and I need to really be able to rally myself, right? So kind of a, a tip to people out there that if, if, they're, if there is doubt that's creeping in, if there's any kind of fear that's starting to navigate the wheel and push you in a different direction, one of the easiest ways to really start to build confidence to get into that right mindset is to count your daily wins at the end of every day. I say, you guys know it. I say it all the time. Yes, right? man. So yes. you got to count your daily, no matter how big, no matter how small, whatever it be, you know, uh, so-and-so smiled at me today. Yep. Or, you yep. know, I, I, you know, made one sale or there was that one person that didn't hang up, right? Whatever, yep. whatever it I be. am grateful for it. As I'm opposed to the people that did hang up, who was the one person that did, buddy, that was huge. I say it all the time, and I love the fact that you just reiterated that. Um, and, and talking to that fear thing, did you ever see that video, Will Smith, uh, everything you want is on the other side of fear, and he's talking about him skydiving? Yeah, yep. Okay, yep. like just, I mean, for anybody who hasn't, I, I, I'll let you go find it on YouTube or whatever. Um, it is a great video. It's not very long, but everything you want is on the other side of fear, right? Yep. So. Yep. Trav, speaking of that then, talking about fear and then going from the fact that you, you got past that, and I, I, I love what you just shared, and thank you for sharing the story, and I love the tie back to the mindset, which is really what the story was about, but how you get to that next spot, right? And you know, with my stuff here, with the Mindshare podcast, um, I mean, for, first of all, I can get talking and I can ramble on a little bit longer, and this episode's going to run longer than, than initially planned, but we, we, there's been so much good already. And I know there's a bunch more that's about to come. So, you know, flipping over to the social media side of things in the Facebook part of the world, which is really where, you know, you're navigating every single day, like 25 hours a day, eight days a week type thing. Right. right. Um, I believe personally, we've had this conversation that before spending a ton of money on social media, we really need to have our organic game on point. And the reason I say this, okay, is, we need to know how to use the platform, right? We need to build that foundation of followers, those people. And again, those people could typically be friends. They could be family members. But bottom line, we need to be engaged in it if we want to try to leverage it, right? Now, I do believe that once we've got the organic traction, we can start to put up the walls and then go ahead and put on the roof. But Fast forwarding from that, so many people want to know, and I get the call a lot, you get it, we know it's out there. How can they leverage Facebook from an advertising angle? And as usual, the absolute first question anybody ever asks, so how much is it? So I've heard numbers of, you know, spend $10 a day for every 100,000 people you want to you target. Um, and then like, again, just from being a marketer and a strategist and, and understanding that world, then there's management fees beyond that. And, and understandably, it all ranges. But money being a factor for most people, what is someone looking at with regards to cost for ads per month if they want to generate enough traction in that sort of 30-day window, right? right? And then what's on top of that? So there's like an ad cost and there's a management cost. Like what, what is like even minimum buy-in looking like for people? You know, it, it, it really it depends on their goal. And if, if your goal is to generate leads, which, you know, most of us for the real estate industry, that's you know, our main objective is we want to build a pipeline of leads that we can nurture over time and then convert into actual clients. So the lead generation component, um, and you can hit it you know, right from the, from the start, is that the, the typical ad spend um, needs to be, the sweet spot is $10 a day per 100,000 people in the audience. So, okay, so that was okay, good. Good. Yes, you know, you're, you're on, on point there. Um, and reason why is because Facebook is a, a bidding an auction process, right? You're going into a platform with a blind auction. So the moment you run an ad, you're entering into an auction, but it's a blind auction, so you, you can't see what maybe the 
500 or 1,000 other advertisers are bidding for a similar audience or similar placements, right? So, you know, Instagram, a marketplace, or whatever it might be. Now, what you're doing in those auctions is you are triggering the algorithm to really find the best ads that are going to be relevant to the audience and then match that and saying, all right, now who's also bidding the proper amount right. that is uh, going to, going to win. Right. So it's Who not always, it's, yeah. Well, it's not always about spending um, more money, right? There's a lot of people out there that spend a ton of money, but they, they their ads aren't winning. Okay. Because they so it's not necessarily, I was about to ask that it's not necessarily about up in the daily budget necessarily. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good yeah. Point. So yeah, cool. for instance, let's say you're competing against a uh, pottery barn and they're spending maybe, let's say 20,000 a month um, for, you know, a certain area and you're competing against a uh, pottery barn in the same market offering real estate services, whatever else you, you know, your ad might be just because you're not spending 20,000 or 25,000 a month. Um, it doesn't mean that you're not going to win. Right. It comes down to the algorithm and how Facebook really interprets that data. And it stands, the algorithm basically is, is uh, stands for bear. So uh, like think of a big mean grizzly bear and it stands for bidding expected action and relevancy. So first, what are you bidding in the ad auction? Um, you want to bid high enough that you are entering into the ad auction, you're competing, but you don't have to go overkill with it. Right. And then from there, it looks at expected action. What is the expected action that the objective that you chose is? And how likely is the audience going to take action on that? And then the auction is a daily thing. It goes on and on. It's not just one time, right? It's, it's recurring daily. So after time, the expected action learns from the actual campaign. It says, okay, we got a pretty good solid click through rate. We got people clicking and engaging with people like turning into leads. And then it's learning from that. So the first 72 hours, it goes to that learning phase in the pacing mode is what it's called, where basically it's pacing through the ad auction, trying to find the right people, the low hanging fruit to then learn from in machine learning. And then it says, got it, you want us to find more people just like that, we're gonna go out in the algorithm and sort of serve it to those individuals that are very similar to the ones that have already become leads. God. Now, that process right there, tells Facebook, hey, the bid that this person placed combined with the actual expected actions that are taking place tells us that we are meeting um, basically kind of the optimal consumer experience. So we're going to then allow them to win more placements in the ad auction. So now we're gonna place them in Marketplace and Instagram over the next two days because there's some good spots in there and they won that part of the ad auction. So we're going to serve it to those users and then relevancy, right? How relevant is the ad and ad copy and ad creative to the consumer, to the targeted consumer? They judge that relevancy by click through rate engagement. Um, are people hiding the ad in their news feed and saying, I don't want to see it or are they interacting with it? So all those components are kind of buzzing all at once. So the advertiser bid is important, but it's not that important when you look at the other factors. It's just one of the key pillars. So, you know, you, you should be spending for lead generation, you know, $10 a day, give or take, per 100,000 people in the audience, right? Okay. That's kind of, a, kind of a gold standard there. Okay, now, cool. so then, 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 then if somebody says, does that mean I need to budget? $300 a month to be out? Like, is that kind of where, I mean, is there, if I'm doing my monthly budget, how do I break that down and say, what am I dedicating to strictly Facebook ads? Yeah. So it, it, it's exactly like that 30 days times 10, like 10 bucks. Yeah, typically. Yeah. So, you know, we're in three to 400 a month at a baseline, right? right. At or a for, baseline though. Like or, that's the idea. Um, for lead generation, right? right. Specifically lead generation. If we're talking about like video view uh, engagement, so right now on average, for someone to watch about 75% of my videos, which is almost watching the entire video, right? Yeah. Because um, you can break those metrics down. You can say, oh, you know, I want to create a custom audience uh, that can run ads to of everyone right. that watched 25, you know, 10%, 25%, yeah. 50, 75, 100. So, 
it cost me around 40 cents um, video view, so 40 cents per person to watch almost 75% of my videos. Now, most of my videos are over five minutes long. Okay. So if I was to go out in public right now and say, uh, is there anyone that's willing right, to watch me or you know, listen to me talk for five minutes about a specific thing um, and I'll pay you 40 cents, a lot of people would just say, you know, fuck off, right? <laughs> like they're not, they're not gonna oh, stick around for oh, that, right? Yeah. But with Facebook, that's the beautiful thing with this is that this kind of strategy is that you can run a video view campaign to a wide audience and then though it's gonna show you there's a certain percentage that watched three seconds and said, it's not for me and that's okay. Then there's people watch 10 seconds and said, ah, I don't wanna watch it anymore, it's not for me. They watch 15 seconds, ah, I was kind of interested, you know, I left. But the people that watch 25, 50, 75, 100%, they actually expressed behavioral intent, right? Their behavioral action. So how do you budget for that though? How do you say if my, like I get the, lead thing, which I think right. most realtors, most of the agents we we're dealing with are really looking for that lead gen. Right. But if going after a video view, what would the simple, simplistic budget look like for that then? You know, really that, that's okay. a great way just to test it is Got to it. say a hundred dollar budget. Let's put it out there. See what happens. Yeah. So, and run, so run that hundred dollar budget for what a week, two weeks, a month. Do, do it as, as a, a lifetime budget okay. over, or yeah, over the course of 30 days and then see if you have an audience, whatever the audience might be, it could be 25,000 or 50,000 people, um, you'll be able to then see the results at the end of it. Now, with that type of spend, you can then need to go back and really see, okay, how much did it cost me to get people to watch 100% of the video? How much did it cost to get people to watch 50% of the video? You really need to look at those metrics, right? 10, 10 seconds and beyond and see what that cost was. And that's going to really kind of dictate, okay, well, if I can get people to watch my videos for 30 cents, then if I doubled down and said, I'm going to spend 200 or $300 on this, then I can exponentially grow that audience and probably get even maybe a lower cost per, per view. With video views, you don't need to spend that much money to get a lot of people to actually watch. I mean, I, before this, I was with a, a client we were reviewing their campaign and we saw that he had spent, uh, I think it was $126, and he's had over 10,825 people watch his wow. videos. Cool. Five different videos with only a very, you know, really realistically, not a lot of ad spend. And over 10,000 people have watched. Wow. Right? I How mean, long and, was this and, video? Per just... Or is it, I guess you said it was a bunch of videos that he put out. It was about six different videos, each one about three to four minutes long. And at the 100% uh, bracket, uh, it was around 4,000 people that, okay. that, that watched 100%. So 4,000 people have watched 100% of those wow. videos. That's a big audience for a, a really small amount of ad spend. Yeah. Um, and so now... You know, he's got a great audience that has actually said, hey, I'm interested in, in what you're talking about. And then you can retarget them with a Facebook lead ad offering more information. So you're going to turn those video views that cost you maybe, you know, a hundred bucks, turn those video views into actual leads with okay. name. Okay, now to that then, wait a second, money. So I've just spent on video views. I've spent on, I'm now going to step that up because I got to support the video view efforts. I got to step that up to start going into this idea of leads because I want to try to capture the information. Right. Man, this sounds confusing. Can I, <laughs> like, I, I need some help with it. Yeah. Uh, not, and again, understanding that that can be a wide range of what do you need for help. Right. If I said, okay, I'm doing about a hundred bucks for my video views. And whether I skip that step and go straight to leads or not, but my leads are going to be about three, 400 bucks for ad spend. So I could be that three to $500 range in a month for my ad spend, which is pretty much what we're, we're sharing back with people from all of my learning. Right. What does it look like to say somebody's going to step in and help me? Here's kind of how much more money I need to budget. Is it another hundred dollars a month? Is it another thousand dollars a month? What should I just factor in again, range it, whatever, you know what I mean? Right. Cause I know there's a lot of specifics to this prop to answer this properly. What am I looking at though? What should I budget on top of that now on top of my, um, 
You know, it, it, it depends, right? It depends on a few different factors. So if you're joining, let's say, a coaching group like ours, yep. um, where we walk you through all of those steps, so we show you exactly how to do it, then, you know, that's $400 a month, essentially, right, for the coaching And then group. I'm still doing it on my own, though, through, through guidance. Y exactly. You do right. it on your own. Yes. Uh, you can okay. tap into our support team, and they do live, you know, screen shares with you in the group, and there's a, a lot cool. of, like, 300 different videos that are really in depth and, and a lot of different information and coaches in there. So that's something that, you know, you can really start to gain a lot of knowledge and get a lot of ground with then, you know, basically saying, Hey, $400 a month to invest in our knowledge, right. To be able to really download that and execute with support. And then you're probably looking at, you know, maybe around $400 a month in ad spend, right. That you yeah. really work with. So okay. um, that's that component there, right? If you really want to invest in yourself and be able to learn. If you're looking to hire someone and have them do it, we offer you know, a various amount of different services in our Facebook advertising agency. Um, and we work and operate at a pretty high level based on our skill set and knowledge and mm -hmm. create advanced campaigns. And then we create campaigns that are not so advanced. So we range anywhere from basically um, 800 a month in our management fee all the way up to around 2,500 a month. Okay. Um, it, you know, and, it, and that just depends on the complexity of the campaigns and, and what we're building. So most people out there should probably budget around, you know, a thousand dollars management. Um, if, if there's someone that's saying, Hey, we're going to build this complex campaign for you with text and emails and, retargeting ads and they're typically charging less than, uh, you know, $1,500, uh, or $1,900. Um, I would be careful because there's a lot that goes into those kind of campaigns. Yeah. And, um, you know, the average Facebook marketer kind of industry wide, um, is around 2,500 to $5,000 a month. That's right. for just for, just for management. Just for management, yeah, yeah. and that, that's yeah, that's uh, as, as you creep up there, you know, because we charge at the high end, yeah. um, you know, twenty five hundred, and, and then for our complex, you know, more robust campaigns. Uh, for instance, we had one that had uh, it was nationwide. We had twenty two different locations, twenty two different uh, franchise brokerages, um, over seven hundred agents, and then fourteen different CRMs. Right, wow. we had you know. Uh, a lot of different ads. A it's lot really, of complexity, yeah. a lot of moving parts of that. A lot of moving parts, a lot yeah. of really complex. Okay. Right? okay. So, yeah. so, so we've got an idea around dollar value. Um, we've got an idea around what cost looks like. And I mean, you know, this podcast, along with like pretty much everything I do, always revolves around trying to add as much value as possible. Um, and a lot of that is about specifically you know, building mindshare, uh, top of mind, intuitive, instinctive reaction to a product or service, right? So, I mean, with that, knowing that we've got an idea around cost, um, minimum buy into the Facebook marketing, when we're doing this stuff, are we talking to people we know or are we talking to people we don't know, just in a quick nutshell there, or is this a, is this a mix of both? You know, this, this should be um, a mix of both. And now, we should we we highly encourage that you should be going after basically three different audiences at, at, at every second of the day if you okay. can. Who are those? If it's within the budget, right? So, um, audience number one should be a cold audience, an audience meaning that there's a bunch of strangers that have never heard of you before. Yeah. And you should be running ads to them that are focused on generating them as leads for the sole purpose of you being able to then nurture them through text and email campaigns and retarget them with different ads, you're basically going to indoctrinate them and pre-frame in their mind over time that you are the trusted authority figure, right? In that specific niche. And on average, it takes about 19 to 22 touches now to convert a prospect. So it used to be seven. Yeah, that's but right. It used to be seven, but now studies have shown that it's actually around 19 to 22. Now, what do you mean by touch points? That's text, email, that's Instagram ads, that's Facebook ads, right? That's being able to see you in different places over the course of several months, 22 times. But what we do is we emphasize that several hundred times yeah, okay. and really maximize that. So yeah. 
your cold audience that you're going after, Which you take them through that funnel process. You don't right. just generate leads and let them sit there. You just don't, you know, show the video and don't right. do it with it. It needs to be a process, right? That's audience one. So cold audience. Yep. Turning strangers into a warm audience. Right. Right. So the second one you need to go after is then the sphere of influence, right? The people that know you and love you and trust you already. So uh, past clients, friends and family, right? People that you are associating with on, on a daily basis, parents at the school where your kid goes to, you have them in a whole separate audience. And that's a warm audience, right? That audience, you're typically not spending a lot of money on. It, right. it's, it's a very small audience. So you can have a high impact by running ads to them that are video view ads. I and mean, there's tons of different types of content that you can run to them. And you're not selling really with that. All you're doing is providing more content, reciprocity, and value, educational type of marketing, right? So it could be about open houses or it could be, you know, the top five things every first and home. The market. value stuff that they should be giving. That free value, yeah. educate people, show them that you know what you're talking about. Right, Absolutely. exactly. And that's, that goes a long way with that audience because yeah. if you think of it this way, that audience is where you get most of your referrals from, right? That's where you, people get about 60% of their business from is their past clients. Absolutely, absolutely. So you should be leveraging that, right, by running ads to them that aren't necessarily, when people think ads, they think, well, I'm selling, but really you're just using that as an opportunity. Awareness. In front of them, just awareness. Now, and is that running awareness ads, by the way, or video view ads? Is that kind of the, the idea there? You know, there's, there's a combination of different types of okay. objectives to, to work with there. So you're not turning them into leads. You're really just using either the reach objective, engagement, or video view uh, are typically kind of top three that you're going you're gonna to use there. Um, with a combination of different ads over time, right? You're dripping out to those folks. Now, with that audience, with that is a great opportunity because you can then run email campaigns to them. Right. At the same time, you're running ads to them. So it creates this omnipresence, right? It's hyper relevant. We call that mind share. <laughs> mind share. Yes. <laughs> build mind share. You can exactly. use it, Travis. Go ahead. You can use you the can, term. Yep. You say you build mind share. <laughs> Trademarks. Um, so you build mind share with them, essentially, right? So you are getting in their mind over time. So when they yeah. think, well, you know, my sister needs to buy a house. Right. Who should I call? You're top of mind, right? So that's that's a budget that's really simple, maybe a hundred bucks a month, right? Right. Just okay. Just of influence. So that's audience number two. two. Audience number three should be a lookalike audience, and a lookalike audience is basically um, an audience that looks very similar to a very specific custom audience that you're creating. So with that you need to think about who are my most valued past clients? Who are the people that I know that are in a specific price range or income or life stage, whatever it might be. And then you're gonna upload that list, create a lookalike audience out of that custom audience, and it's gonna find people that are very similar and like kind. It's gonna actually find 2,000 unique key attributes for each one of those individuals. That's what Facebook does, right? It scours through, generates that data and says, hey. Well, what list was I putting up? Like an email list, an address list? You know, if, if you have business the manager, name, Is that what you mean by a list? Yeah, basically, yeah, name, email, phone number, right? So, so how, how does it know based on name, email, phone number? I mean, mind you, this is Facebook. Uh, yeah. But how does it know by name, email, phone number? I guess it knows who these people are and it starts to go, oh, we know who Travis is for, you know, and David wants to market to Travis. So we're going to find somebody that, it's kind of like Travis as well and market to that person for David as well. Exactly. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. It, it just, it find, you know, finds them on Facebook and says, Hey, we found a user ID. We, we made a data match. Um, and now we're going to find more people that are very similar to David um, all across the nation. It's going to be on a national scale. Then you're going to then create a lookalike audience, which is typically around like 1 million, 1.5 million. And then you're going to put it into your audience and then narrow that down to say, my city, my state, whatever it is, right. and that will, might, might go from like 1.5 million down to like 300,000 people or 150 okay. whatever it might be. Um, that's audience number three, right? Look like audiences work really, really well. So you should be going after those three audiences over time, right? Your cold audience of strangers, building a pipeline of leads that you're going to nurture yep. based on their interests, the, the targeting you've created. 
in your sphere of influence, people that know you and love you, keep it in front of them, right? And encourage referrals. And then your lookalike audience, which is an audience that's very similar to people that are probably gonna buy or sell in the near future, but you're just using Facebook's big data to really find the best match of those individuals. And you know, depending on the kind of campaign, well, over time, you're gonna build a lot of brand awareness, a lot of uh, basically kind of emotional bond if you're doing it right with those people, and then they're going to be the ones that you're gonna be the celebrity in front of, right? You can be a celebrity in front of only a, a thousand people, right? You're a celebrity to those thousand people, yep. but that's your pond to fish out of consistently for a year, two years, whatever it might be. And, and you know what? So some great insight in that because we talk a lot about that, especially with again um, within the Mindshare Challenges, our, our groups and all that stuff about who are your audiences, what are you doing to go after these people, and so you know you've just taken that and really parlayed that into the sort of the Facebook, the online world. Um, but one thing that you said, which I mean, I, I always, always really, really emphasize with people is, you know, you can set up anything. I mean, you can come to kits and you can set up kits and you can you know work with the Facebook stuff and set up the Facebook. I mean, anything you do it's not set it and forget it. Like you've got right. to get involved. You've got to have the right funnel set up. You've got to know why you're doing what you're doing, what you're trying to achieve, and then what you need to do in the middle to kind of take it from what you just spent money on and executed on as a marketing campaign to turning that into what does my day-to-day look like, my small individual wins, like you mentioned off your story off the top. What are my small individual wins? What am I accomplishing every day? How right. am I getting myself one step closer to that spend that I did, that project, that, that campaign, how right. am I taking it to the end game? Right. Um, so with that then, you know, when we look at what they can do out there and we, we have a sense of dollars, we have a sense of audience. When we look at the type of stuff they can do on Facebook, and I mean, you mentioned a bunch, um, uh, you know, awareness ads and, and video views and, 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 and uh, lead ads, right? You just mentioned out, uh, you know, reach and engagement, right? Those are, so there's a lot of different ads and Facebook, and I know just personally, Facebook's, you know, ad business manager allows you to kind of select your objective there. But then I look from a mindshare perspective and go, there's some stuff that's pretty badass out there that like that. I, I mean, I remember the first times I saw like remarketing where it's like, I'm on a website looking for, you know, lawnmowers and all of a sudden I'm shopping for shoes and I'm getting like advertised for freaking lawnmowers. You want to talk mind share and awareness. Like to me, you know, that's a big one. Um, another thing we teach in our, in our mind share challenge is a lot about, uh, you know, and I think you, you've coined this as micro geo farming, uh, right. I think, but I, I social media farming, right? It's, it's yeah. now I'm going to take this flyer, this door knock, this cold call prospecting I've been doing, I'm going to integrate that online as well. And I'm right. going to target this small little neighborhood there. What would you say is like, if somebody kind of wanted to start right now, they figured out their dollars, they got a better sense now of what they're doing with their audience. They are engaged on an organic level, but they're now going, okay, I put the budget aside. I, I, I'm ready to rock and roll. And realistically, yeah, market's a little slow. I'm looking for more business. Period. Forget, yep. and I don't want to say forget the reciprocity because I, I, I really do preach that every single day to people. And I think that everybody really has to understand how important that is. But we're just going beyond that and we're going, we're spending dollars. We want more business. Right. What is maybe one, two, three, I don't know, just a couple of things that you might say to people, hey, start here today. You know, if, if someone's just getting started, one of the top things that I say is, Get your list of past clients, friends, and family, right? Thank you. Drop the mic. See you later. Bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs> that's, <laughs> Sorry, keep going. Really, I mean, that's, that's the easiest. That's the lowest hanging fruit, right? Is yep. the people that know you, love you, and, and trust you. So if you can get a list um, of, you know, let's say you've got maybe 1,400 people, right? Friends, family, past clients, whatever it is. You upload that as a custom audience in a CSV uh, file, right? Where you get their name, email, phone number, zip code, city, state, right? Upload it up there. And then just start to run video uh, ads just to that audience. And really, you know, maybe have $25 uh, per ad that you're going to run and maybe just do two of those a month. So that way you saturate the entire audience, they see you. Um, I would then 
once you get people that actually start to comment on those videos and like it and share it, then you have social proof on those ads or those videos, whatever it is. So once you get social proof on that, you can then take that same ad and then run that ad to a local area that you're farming, right? A specific area that you want to run those ads to. And then when they see those videos, those new people, that are the cold audience, they're gonna go, oh man, people already like us. They got are engaging with it, right, exactly. Right, has 14 shares, right, has, you know, 26 comments, has, you know, 182 people that have liked it. this? Let me check it out. Oh, I think yeah. I've seen that guy or that girl before, yeah. I mean, that's his own form of social proof, right? Yeah. You know, social currency that people go, oh, people, you know, and then just start running those, right, to that farming area. Okay. Um, and then you're gonna see people are watching in that farm, right? People are watching those videos. Then I would create a custom audience of everybody that has watched 25% of those videos in that area. Let it build, let it build a couple months and then start to run Facebook lead ads to that custom audience of anyone that watched those videos offering an item of value, right? Offering something like a list of homes or a seller's guide or a home value and then you are going to have some sort of text email automation sequence set up that's going to nurture those folks, but you're turning all of the views and those likes into leads, right? And then now by the time they actually talk to you towards the end there, it should be a warm engagement, right? They've seen your videos, they've seen you online, they know what you have to offer, they have watched the videos to a certain percent because the behavioral actions have said, hey, I'm interested in the exact topic that you have to offer. So I'm probably in the right life stage in the next three to eight months to probably buy or sell. That's what I would do. I, I, I love that. And, and uh, I mean, you know what? I hope everyone was taking notes on that. That was, the, that was a beautiful roadmap, man. I thank you for sharing that stuff. I really, really do. Um, what about the, uh, and then again, just because it, it's one that I think is very cool, but retargeting, Obviously, through Google, you know, searchability, uh, but we've seen the crossover between the two platforms where you can find, you can search Google and somehow Facebook's advertising to you. Is that a Google strategy? Is that a Facebook strategy? Is it a both? Um, that's, that's both, right? Okay. So there's, there's audience. Like can I do that? Sorry, sorry to cut you off. Can I do that through Facebook alone without a Google ads account? No. Yeah, okay. yeah. With with that, you're going to need Google, and, and or you're going to need a third party service like um, Perfect Audience, um, or AdRoll, AdRoll, or Perfect Audience. Those are two places that you can um, dis- have display ads that retarget people, right? Based on on either a list uh, that you upload uh, or connected to your CRM. Either of those two systems are actually allowing you to retarget people through Facebook. Yeah, Facebook. So those those will allow you to run ads on Facebook, Instagram, and Google, um, and then all all of their other other partners. Um, I you know I like to kind of flip it on its head a little bit. So um, we highly suggest if you have traffic that's coming from Google, organic traffic, right? Google, Yahoo, Bing, whatever it might be, that's going to your website. Yeah. You need to have a Facebook Pixel installed on that website because. Those are high intent prospects that are actually searching keywords because they have a need, right? They have a task at hand. And so the task, whatever it is that, hey, I want to see a home or can I buy a house for zero down or, you know, uh, houses for sale in Knob Hill, whatever it might be, they end up on your website because they have a need and a desire. They have a task they want to actually accomplish. So their intent is much higher. Now, they end up on your website and they search around, they get information, or, or they don't, and then they leave. Well, if you're not retargeting them, then they just go off into, into the ether, right? They're just, they're out of- simple. Sorry, and I'm, I'm with you, because I'm getting this, and just for anybody who's not, so we're talking about, you can create a Facebook pixel through Business Manager, it's there, you then take that pixel, if you don't know how to do this, you go to your web people, whatever, but you basically install that pixel on every page you've got on your website. Right. Now, when I visit your website, this pixel from Facebook is going to pick up the fact that I've been there. It's going to start to track that and it's going to save me in its world and kind of go, hey, you know, Travis, David has been there, but it's, it's a little more complicated than that. But that's the idea. Right. Exactly. Tell exactly. Facebook, I've been to your site. I've landed on this page. 
Exactly. Right. And then now is your opportunity to then start running ads to those people that went to the website Perfect. on Instagram. And, and, and that's through audience selections again. And that could be a very similar process to what you explained here with respect to, I mean, not the list upload, but the idea of what are we sending to these people? Right. Always keeping reciprocity in mind and keeping what that final process would be. Exactly. And it's your opportunity to really control the narrative. So in your prospect's mind, and, and think of it this way. Um, and we, we came up with this whole methodology and campaign structure um, at my, when we were at the brokerage during a time where um, I had stumbled upon, uh, I was in someone's funnel essentially. And so I was shopping for an engagement ring for uh, my, my girlfriend, now wife. Yeah. And so she did say yes. Um, <laughs> how to close that deal. So the, the time there was kind of an odd time because retargeting was, was not really used a lot. It was, it was pretty, you know, pretty new. So I visited about 12 different engagement websites online. And I'm looking through um, these different websites and trying to find the right ring that you know makes sense and, and that's in my budget. And I'm going through the process, and this is over like three months that I'm looking at these 12 different websites. Well, over time, there's this one website, this this engagement ring website, that keeps following me online. I keep seeing their ads pop up. And it's, their ads are almost like storytelling. They go over how the diamonds are made, right? Uh, where they're sourced. And then the next ad that I see a couple weeks later is the kind of bespoke artisan uh, behind the scenes uh, with the, you know, the, the guy uh, in his leather kind of apron, you know, looking at the diamonds and designing it. And then the next ad beyond that was kind of a sneak peek about how they actually uh, make the actual diamonds from the designs. He kept going through this kind of storytelling advertising again and again, and I kept seeing the ads, and it brought me back to a blog article or to a video that they had. Now, during the time, I couldn't tell you what the other 11 websites were, what right. the names were, what the brands were, right? They were all gone. And it, I had this kind of epiphany, this moment where I said, wow, this is very similar to buying a house or selling a house. Yeah. It's a big emotional life stage, yep. right? It's a big emotional decision and it's a big investment, right? So each of those was right in line with buying or selling a house. And I thought, well, if I could do this for real estate, imagine the impact that would have because I'm about to spend a lot of money on this ring. It's a big emotional decision. I only want to do it once. And I've spent a lot of months researching it. I can't remember the other 11 engagement rings yep. with the websites. So I bought this one because it kept in front of me. And that's the power of retargeting, right? That's the power of being able to tell the story, control the narrative, take people through this indoctrination process, right? Pre-framing in their mind that you are the right solution. But there's a methodology to it too. And the methodology that we created after creating a lot of different campaigns and, and you know, for those that are kind of out there, like, well, what's a lot of campaigns? We've generated close to four hundred thousand leads on wow. Instagram. So we we handle you know some campaigns are spending fifty thousand a month. Some campaigns are only spending around five hundred a month. Just depends on the budget size and you know who we're targeting. So with a lot of data, we found out that there is certain content pillars that you should have in your retargeting sequence. Okay, to really make that emotional bond and to be able to really win over that prospect over time. And so it's called BURST. So our methodology that we create is called BURST, and then BURST stands for brand story or brand introduction. And that could be done in a various different amount of ways, right? It could be a video of you saying something along the lines of, uh, you know, our company's been around for over 15 years. We've helped 3,000 families grow. You know, we love our community. It could be like this drone showing, you know, the whole different places or that you work in, whatever it might be. But yeah. brand story, brand introduction. Then you have untapped opportunity. An untapped opportunity is basically different opportunities they didn't know exist that they want. So it could be a uh, list of open houses that are going to be held open this weekend. 
um, see all the foreclosures or all the properties you can buy with zero down, whatever it might be, something that is untapped opportunity that they can't really get anywhere else, but you've solidified what it is and you're putting it right in front of them. Then you have reciprocity. Reciprocity is giving them items of value, right? Being the educator. So that could be the, uh, you know, the six things that are going to increase your credit score over the next six months before you buy a home. Or the, you know, the top 10 profit sucking mistakes that every homeowner makes. Um, or how to sell your house for more than it's worth, right? Here's the seven point guide written by top producing agents. Whatever it might be, you wanna give them reciprocity and something that they can actually read or watch that impresses upon them that you know what you're talking about and then it builds that trust, right? Okay, right? yeah. So that's what we're getting to is all of that builds trust. The know you like you trust you factor, absolutely. Exactly, and then there's social proof. And social proof is um, where either case studies, right? So see how I sold this house for $23,000 over asking in only 15 days or it could be uh, a video testimonial from some buyers that worked with you, whatever it might be, case studies or testimonials, or it could just be your market share size, right? You know, a carousel ad just saying, look at the properties that we've sold, you know, in yeah. the past six months. Um, all of that builds trust and it creates this likability and it basically answers all of their questions that they have over time. Well, who is this person, right? right. Who's worked with them? Do they have any success? Right. Well, what can they, you know, can they answer any of my questions that I, that I have? And you try to join the prospects conversation in their mind, right? With the ads that you have running while you're sleeping. And the end goal with that, of course, is that at the same time that they're seeing all those retargeting ads, yeah. that ideally you've already generated them as a lead, that you have them on a drip nurture campaign. Right. That's reaching out to them. So while you're working with the other clients, while you're showing homes, while you're at the pool, at the golf course, and while you're sleeping, you have the power and leverage of software and automation tools and Facebook and Instagram advertising doing all of this mind share capturing for you so that when you do connect with that prospect and talk to them, it's a warm engagement. They already know you, they should like you, hopefully, right? They know where you are, what you're about, and you can cut to the chase and you don't have to sell yourself hard in pitch, right? It's right. already done. Is that what the T is then in burst is trust? Trust. Yep. Perfect. So then from that then, where you've, you've broken that down, and I mean, again, I, I love and thank you so much for, for, for giving us the insights into this stuff. What kind of frequency are you seeing where you've just basically explained to me, realtor, you know, we've got one, two, three, four, four steps to kind of get to trust Right. after we've already kind of picked up the lead. So there were steps before it. And again, this is that funnel process. This is that next step. Of right. We're going to make it come to life. So we're, we're, we're taking that lead. We're going to retarget these people now. My brand story, how long am I running that for? Is that a week to that audience? Is that a month to that audience? Is you it, know, it, it, it the next day I do the next one? Or is everything set up to go back to back? Like what? Yeah, I mean, basically they're, they're gonna be dripped out like a, a drip email sequence and, and we kind of call it like a, a push along funnel essentially. You're pushing them from one to the next, right? So this is one campaign with multiple ad sets? Is that kind of how they look at it? Be basically, yeah, mm -hmm. like, and depending on the objective that you're using. Sometimes it can be a couple of campaigns that kind of sandwich over each other. But, but does Facebook it, know then when I've looked at the first one, send me, serve me up the second one? Oh, okay, yeah. I see. Yeah. So it, it'll, I mean, just putting it all out there together. It's basically going live at the same time. The good love at the same time. It, it's kind of like a cascading waterfall, right? Gotcha. One cascades into the other. Gotcha. So there's a, there's about five different ways to really structure it. Um, it, it you can do it all behavioral based. If they watched this video, shouldn't this video, if they watch that video, shouldn't this right. video, right? right? That's where it's, it's really niches down smaller and smaller. Yeah. Um, but you need a big audience for that to really, really work on that one. Um, the way that we typically do is based on, they interacted with this at the top, so everyone moves along in, right. in one big uh, audience moving to the next thing, next thing after a while. So the frequency, ideally, is that they should be seeing maybe, you know, uh, for 20 days, for 10 to 20 days, they should be seeing one ad probably about maybe 10 times on average, 10 to 12 times. 
during the, tw the 20 day span uh, and then so on and so on. So you can dial on the frequency. It, it, it all depends on the audience size that you're working with, of course. Uh, that's going to change things. Uh, smaller audiences are difficult to work with because the ad auction and feeding it out and Facebook saying, Hey, don't they are this. difficult. It's more, uh, small audiences are more difficult when you are trying to push them through a series of ads through a funnel. But what's a small audience? What's a, what, or, or what would the right audience be with to do that then? Are you talking a hundred thousand, 10,000, 500? What is it? Yeah, so smaller audience is below a thousand people. Okay. Right? So okay. ideally, you want to really have over over a thousand people to really make those audience those okay, audiences. But so so but uh, okay, but that just became a lot more realistic, right? Because if you were going to say to me, you got to have a hundred thousand. Well, most no. realtors are not going after that. No, right. You Businesses can. might be, but the yeah the 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 real estate business, and I'm not trying to downplay anybody's business or how far you're reaching, just more. When we look at the size of the audience you're going at, it's not as large. So Does, yeah, over, so, yeah. But just over a thousand is certainly enough. To, oh, totally. Okay. Yeah, we, we have. I mean, we have a lot of campaigns where we're only retarding maybe twenty five hundred people, right? Those audiences. Got it. Um, and so you're really nurturing a really select few of people. And, and I mean, if you think about it, I mean, this is the new television, right? Yeah, so right, exactly. So you're you're basically this tv celebrity right in their you know world but they think well because this person's on my phone they're probably on everybody's phone but if you're only in front of 2500 people on a consistent basis well you are famous to those 2500 people and to you know, sure what's fame but when fame equates to conversions well conversations the evil conversions that turns into right. closings that 2,500 people, you know, if you take an average price point of whatever it is in your market, and then you start to multiply that, it, it, it they can go a long, long way. Right? Oh, absolutely. And, and I mean, man, I could, I could keep going with you here all day. I know you've got a, you, you've got stuff that you got to get to as well. Um, this has been absolutely amazing. Like, I guess, I guess, I guess I would just ask, and I think I asked this a little bit ago uh, today, but is this stuff just way too freaking difficult for people to do on their own? Like, do they need to hire somebody and do, or like if people really put in the time and effort, can they pull this off themselves? Oh, you totally. Yeah. They, you can, you can do this. If you have the, the patience and you have the thirst for knowledge, that's then you've got to have the thirst for knowledge, the patience and the time though. you have yeah. to. Cause yeah. I know even for myself, I mean, um, and I, I've mentioned this to you before, but, you know, even when we go and we run some of our own stuff and I've done this in the past and whatnot. Yeah, I can get through it. I, I can get it there and I get it. Like all the stuff you're talking about, I get it. I, not the insight the way you've shared it today, which has just been valuable, but I can muster through it. But when I do look back at the amount of time it takes me to get there, yeah, that's something you got to factor in to what else is not getting done while you're spending the time there. And now I will, I will put the punctuation mark on that to say, yes, help, having people help you with that, uh, including somebody obviously like yourself, Travis, you know, with your group, I think it's incredibly beneficial. Um, and, and I would say to everybody, just make sure you're checking your budget first, right? Make sure you can afford this because, you know, just like anything else, and a lot of what Travis just shared with us here as well is that this stuff doesn't happen overnight. It takes, it takes support. It takes grind. It takes hustle. And, you know, it takes patience. So right. with all that, you better have the dollars that are going to stick it out to see it through, not just get it started because, oh, I want to advertise all over Facebook. Right. 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 Yeah. Buddy, this has been, uh, this has been absolutely awesome. Where can people find you? Yeah, if anyone has any questions or they want to check us out, go to elevatedrem.com. So that's elevated R E M, which stands for real estate marketing. So elevated real estate marketing. Uh, so elevatedrem.com. Go there. We've got all of our services, uh, ways to contact us, contact me, and you know, for for uh, those that are kind of what are you know what is this what does this do? And does it work? Um, so we've been able to track over 400 million in sales from our Facebook advertising efforts, wow. um, which I mean, so you're running an ad, generating a lead and then, then actually closing and then you getting a commission check. That's, that's that 400 million. So these do work. I've been able to build three different real estate companies from Facebook advertising 
And then we built actually three different software as a service companies that we own. So we definitely put our money where our mouth is because we've been able to grow our own individual companies straight through Facebook advertising. So whatever industry it is, um, unless it's like wrestling alligators, you know, in like South, you know, Florida, whatever it might be, it's probably, it might be too obscure, but it does work. You just got to play the long game and yeah. know that you got to build those audiences and build that trust to turn that machine on. And then it's going to be the one working. Right. So just kind of, kind of go back, right. Whoever can hold their breath the longest wins. I so it's all about it. playing the, the tie together there, man. And uh, I mean, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on it. David, it's always a pleasure. Uh, last time we spoke, we had tequila. This time we did not. I think I had a beer. Let, let, let's be clear because, you know, I, I won't touch the tequila. And if my wife found that out and, and, and I'm telling you straight, it, it you, was for sure a beer. You, that's right. You had a beer. You I say had, like vodka, you know, whatever. I don't <laughs> care. If you drop that one. I, I, I got to... <laughs> Anyway, I have tequila for Mrs. Greenspan. Just so, you, so you know, just you know, that would have been the end. We would have not ever seen each other again. It would have been just over. <laughs> but um, to 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 finish this off, you you just mentioned trust, and I'm just going to say to everybody, you know, trust is a big deal, and we don't refer people easily. We don't t recommend people easily, and and instead of our own personal fears that that person we recommend or refer might screw up. And in time, when you build trust, you cannot buy it. It takes time. It takes patience. Sometimes it takes, you know, I don't want to use the word days, maybe weeks, maybe weeks, but months, years to build that stuff. And when I can tell you personally for me with my circle of friends that I've been fortunate to call friends that are, that are all over this continent now, um, that's how I met Travis. And so I would tell you from the circle of people that I know, like, and trust to watch the know, like, and trust factor they have in him. And then to get to sit down together, you and I, uh, and be able to, to just do this stuff together, be it on this podcast or prior to this. Um, I, I, I will sit here and say it's come from a number, enough sources for me that I wanted to have you on today. And I'm going to tell everybody I know, I will recommend Travis and say that, you know, these guys are for real. He, him and his group, they are real deal. They know what's going on. Uh, if you look at his little icon here, it says, you know, Travis Tom, Facebook marketing ninja. Um, they definitely have some master skills. So, you know, take in what you can. I hope you were taking notes. I will put your contact information in the show notes here. Uh, but again, some incredible insight today. Really, really enjoyed the conversation. Learned a bunch. And I thank you again so much for making the time. David, thank you, man. Always appreciate spending time with you. Thank you. And to everyone watching, uh, hey, build that mind share. So you either listen to this on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify. Or maybe you went to industrysyndicate.com or even mindshare101.com. Wherever you like to consume your content, please rate, review, and subscribe. And if you haven't yet, connect with me on Facebook at Mindshare101 and on Instagram at David Greenspan101. This has been another episode of the Mindshare Podcast. Thanks everyone for listening.